which are going to start with a series of quick true false questions. And each one of those is designed to either break down a myth or to give some more awareness or give me a chance to teach. And I think that's really important to do. Let's take a look at this. And these are just true false. Make your best choice. Get in the habit of making a choice. You have to make a choice on the National Register. I'd like to do it here. This one, I'm going to do a little bit of trivia, but it's a 50-50 chance. And in this, the correct answer is true. You can get tamponade from a traumatic condition. And the most common cause of cardiac tamponade is um, a stab wound. And the stab wound ruptures the pericardial sac, it clots off, but then it still bleeds from within. And that's the traditional traumatic cause of cardiac tamponade. And because it's so sudden, we feel the effects of it very acutely. However, medical conditions that can cause tamponade, a buildup of fluid in that cavity that's not blood, include pericarditis, right, an infection of the heart. Chemotherapy can cause that. People that have weakened immune systems and people with lung and mediastinal, you know, chest cancers. And the interesting thing about the cardiac tamponade that occurs when it's a medical condition is you can accumulate so much more fluid because it builds gradually and the heart and the body start to adjust a little bit because of that. So you might have... Um, 100, 200 mLs in the pericardial sac and trauma and the patient's going right down the tubes, but you can do half a liter or more that builds up over a week. And what happens is the patient doesn't exert themselves much. They get out of breath more easily, but the body adapts to this reduced flow over a period of time. So yeah, things like pericarditis, cancer, chemotherapy, weakened immune systems can cause what's called a pericardial effusion. And that pericardial effusion is a connection of, is a collection of fluid. When it starts to impede the heart function, it becomes tamponade. All right, a little bit of trivia, a little bit of knowledge there, and let's put up another poll question. Go into a little pathophysiology. <clears throat> this question really gives me a chance to talk about the alphas and betas of the sympathetic nervous system. All right, so in this, the correct answer is false. <clears throat> and what's the reason for that? The reason for that is the beta blocker may block beta 2. And if it blocks beta 2, it limits vasodilation. So we have to use caution. I'm not saying somebody who has asthma can't take a beta blocker, but somebody who has significant asthma really shouldn't take a beta blocker because um, even if they have an asthma attack, it could limit the effect of the albuterol you give because it blocks that beta, right? Albuterol is a beta-2 agonist, and that's how we dilate our, our lungs, our, our bronchioles. So if we take a beta blocker, now remember, beta-1 stimulates the heart, increased force and rate and all the contractility, and beta-2 dilates the bronchioles, it affects the lungs. The way my students taught me to remember that is beta one is the heart, beta one, there's one heart, beta two, there's two lungs. So since beta two, since beta drugs, unless they're specific to beta one, and there are drugs out there that do that, but older drugs like labetalol and propranolol, you know, the older beta blockers aren't specific or deeply specific to beta one. So it can affect beta two and could hurt someone with asthma. Now, obviously it depends on whether your heart is the bigger issue or your lungs are the bigger issue. But when we block beta two, it affects the lungs and that's a problem. Let's stick with this question. I gave you a little bit of a hint to it, but let's put this up here. So we have found that taking a beta blocker medication would result in a tachycardia. Well, that is false. And here's why. Beta blockers slow down the heart because beta speeds it up. If we block beta, we slow it down. That's why beta blocker medications, the medications that end in OLOL, labetalol, latenolol, metoprolol, propranolol, 
all those medications are used, one, to reduce heart rate and also to lower blood pressure. So if somebody has atrial fib and sometimes their heart gets too fast, they might take a beta blocker. Why? Because it slows it down. So knowing your alphas and betas is really, really important uh, in this because you might get questions like this, but just with four choices on the National Registry. Knowing about the sympathetic nervous system, I believe, is very important. Beta blockers slow the heart. They can also have a negative effect on the lungs, which we talked about in the last question. So continuing on. Let's do a little quick pediatrics here. Oropharyngeal airways are inserted upside down in children and rotated into place. That is false, especially in the young children. In kids, we take and we insert the airway along the pharyngeal curve. We put them in so the curve matches the tongue. And we do that because especially in the little ones, the palate isn't as developed. So that sometimes can cause bleeding if we put them in upside down and rub it against that palate at the top of the mouth. In kids, we put oral airways in along the pharyngeal curve, certainly among the youngest kids. So what did I do here? I knew I'd get some, but about 50-50 here. That's why I cover this material like this, because now if you get a question on the National Registry or a pediatric patient, you'll know what to do. All right, question, I think we're on number five. Let's stay with kids. There we go. This is something that's really important. Uh, for the medics, um, but you get these questions for EMT as well. It's really, really important. Let's close this down, put the answer up. The correct answer is true. What with CPR is performed on a neonate, neonate being the first 30 days of life from birth to those 30 days, three to one, three compressions to one ventilation. Why is that? It's often a ventilation issue. It's an oxygenation issue that, that is the problem with these kids. So we use a little bit of a different uh, rate, three to one. So we're getting a lot of oxygen in and some compressions. All right, the next question. All right, I like this one. But I get people all the time that write me about this. Your patient has an altered mental status. How can I give them glucose? Well, let's talk about this. What's the indication for giving glucose or dextrose if you're a paramedic? But when you're giving oral glucose, and, and medics can certainly give oral glucose, makes it easy. Give somebody a drink. I've had medical emergencies on planes where I've dumped sugar packets into orange juice and, and you know done that because it's still takes a little bit more time, but it works. What are the indications for giving oral glucose? Well, the patient has diabetic history and that they have an altered mental status. If the patient doesn't have an altered mental status, you're not going to give them glucose or dextrose, right? If they're in the, because really, isn't that a two-part indication, right? Because if I have some of the blood glucose of, you know, 56, but they're absolutely fine. You know, I've got to really think about that. I'm thinking, is my blood glucose monitor right? Or is this, you know, the way it is, what's going on? Altered mental status is one of the triggers for us to be able to give glucose or dextrose. It's part of the part of the game. So everyone that you give dextrose or glucose to is going to have an altered mental status. The question, as as Sabrina mentioned, is that we've got to make sure that they can follow commands and that they can swallow. Right, if they take and they squirt a whole tube into their mouth and and then aspirate, obviously we haven't won. And somebody else said they have to be alert. Well, they don't really have to be alert because if they're alert, then they might not have the indication for all glucose, but they do have to be able to follow instructions and swallow, right? And that's the important part. Just remember that everybody that you give oral glucose to is going to have an altered mental status, but the ability to swallow is what makes a really big difference. And I did that on purpose. I don't want you to get hung up on a test question because somebody has an altered mental status. Because everybody that you give glucose to has an altered mental status. 
It just depends how much. Look for indications of whether they can follow instructions, whether they can swallow and manage their own airway. That's what makes the difference. Yes, you can, the answer was true. You can give somebody glucose if they have an altered mental status. Let's go back into pathophysiology for a little bit. So we talked about the sympathetic nervous system with the alphas and the betas. Alpha one constricts, beta one speeds up the heart, beta two dilates the bronchioles, opens up those air passages. But the parasympathetic is involved as well. It's a back and forth, it's a, it's a yin and yang, it's a check and balance kind of thing. All right. The parasympathetic nervous system is activated when I put pressure on a baroreceptor. That is true. If Now, there are people who get syncopal episodes if their shirt collar is too tight. If they take and they shave their neck around their carotid sinus, their carotid artery, and they push too hard, they pass out. Um, and that's because there are baroreceptors in that carotid sinus in your neck. And part of the responsibility of that pressure receptor says, if the pressure gets really high, I activate the parasympathetic nervous system. That's the one that slows things down. I don't want to do the sympathetic nervous system. That's the one that speeds up. If my pressure is too high, what do I want to do? I want to lower my pulse. I want to activate the vagus nerve, lower my pulse, bring my cardiac output down, and affect my blood pressure so and bring my blood pressure down so when you put pressure on a baroreceptor like in your neck if your shirt collar is too tight or if you one of those shaving things and somebody passes out that's because the baroreceptor said whoa it's overly sensitive but it says to the brain too much pressure we got to slow this down so it slows the heart rate down and people either have a very very slow heart rate or they pass out that's because of the baroreceptor all right, let's see how many more we got. We've got three more. Let's go back into the medical realm with this one. All right, here we go. A patient can have a severe allergic reaction to a substance they have never been exposed to, and that's true. It's actually called an anaphylactoid reaction. When we're sensitized to something, we've been exposed to shrimp or egg yolks or something we're allergic to, and then the second time we have them, the body has a reaction to it. The body's been sensitized. An antibody's been attached to mast cells and basophils, and in doing that, once that antigen touches the antibody, we get the allergic reaction. However, you don't have to have antibodies created. Things like if you're getting a CAT scan and you get radio contrast medium, the, I'm doing air quotes here, the dye they give you before they do certain CT and MRI procedures. Sometimes non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and occasional medications can actually cause an anaphylactoid reaction. It looks just like an allergic, I'm sorry, like an anaphylactic reaction. It's severe. You've got to give epinephrine, but the person says, I've never been exposed to this. I have no idea why I'm reacting to this, like you know, because of this. I've never had this medication. And you still can because that antigen, right, that thing that causes the allergic reaction actually opens up those mast cells and basophils. And what happens? histamine and leukotrienes and bradykinins come out and cause all those signs and symptoms, even though they've never been exposed to it before. And that's called an anaphylactoid reaction. So see how much stuff we're getting in here, what we're learning in this? All right, two more.
Patients in diabetic ketoacidosis frequently have blood glucose readings over 700, and that is false. There are three conditions. There's hyperglycemia. You get to somebody's house, they don't feel well, they're peeing a lot, and you see their blood glucose, and it's you know 251. You go, okay, well, if you're a medic, they can probably use a little bit of fluid because they've been peeing a lot. You know, or we take them to the hospital. Sometimes we're the first ones to find that they're diabetics in EMS. But then it gets higher. Then there's two more conditions we got to worry about. Diabetic ketoacidosis happens usually to type 1 or insulin-dependent diabetics. That's because there's no insulin. So the body has nothing else they can do except burn the proteins and fats. And that creates ketones. And that ketoacidosis, the type 1 diabetics who don't have any insulin have no choice but to burn bad things, things the body doesn't really like to burn. So as a result of that, when that happens, they might get a blood glucose of 300 or 400, maybe a little higher. But the problem is that acidosis kind of limits things. That makes them really, really sick. So it generally doesn't get that high. However, in hyperglycemic hyperosmolar syndrome, HHS, that's a lot to say, often happens in, in type 2 or non-insulin-dependent diabetics. And why is that? It's because there's some insulin. And because of that, they can burn some glucose, but not a lot. The body often has become resistant to it. So the type 2 diabetics can probably burn some glucose. They may do some proteins and fats, but not a lot. So the type 2 diabetic often gets a higher blood glucose reading, and that condition is called hyperglycemic hyperosmolar syndrome, and it gets a higher blood glucose because they don't get acidotic and it can go farther. Now, can people have a little bit of both? Yeah, of course they can. And this is just kind of something I wanted to do because whether you're an EMT, AEMT, or paramedic class, you're not taught a lot of this stuff. When you don't have insulin, you can't burn the right fuel. And that causes acidosis. And that's self-limiting. You get too acidotic, you get really sick, and the blood glucose doesn't generally get that high. You got some, and you can burn that. The type 2 diabetics, because of that, will generally have a much higher blood glucose reading. All right, last question coming up. I'll give you a hint. This could be related to a prior question. All right, but the correct answer was false. Kussmaul's breathing is seen in acidosis. Things like diabetic ketoacidosis is rapid, deep breathing as a result of an acidotic state. We're trying to blow off some CO2 and bring our, um, our pH down, right? Trying to get rid of some of that acid. In increasing intracranial pressure, I like to say that we have irregular respirations. And that's because it's really hard to really tell these patterns, especially on the fly with a critical patient. And there's so much else to do. Chain stokes breathing, apneustic breathing. And if you have a head injury that causes rapid, deep breathing, that's called central neurogenic hyperventilation. It looks like Kussmaul's, but it's caused by a head injury. So Kussmaul's is from a medical condition that results in acidosis, and that's different than central neurogenic hyperventilation, which looks similar, but that's caused by head trauma. All right, and that covers all of my questions.